Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome to our afternoon study. We're now in the last book of Leviticus. I'm sorry, last chapter of Leviticus, the book of Leviticus. And uh, <clears throat> quite a bit we've covered. We'll do kind of a little review at the end, but we come to this interesting chapter. And it deals with dedication, um, making vows. Um, and, and, and we have to view this in with the idea of this is all volunteer. This is this is not something that's required. These these people are volunteering. Um, and I found the system of this vow to be very interesting because in a lot of cases it was, it, it, in most cases it was done and the redemption was monetary. So um, the monetary uh, re redemption was given to the priests to the poor um, so that they, they had provision. So very interesting chapter and I'm sure we'll find quite a bit of principles that we need to apply. We're gonna look at some things in the Brit that kind of um, show um, the necessity to keep the promises that we make to Elohim to keep the vows, to make it of importance, uh, the things that we give to him for service, even ourselves, um, that it's no small thing. You know, that when we look to dedicate our lives for a particular service, it requires much thought, it requires much prayer, it requires that we diligently make sure that that's what he's calling us to do, and not to do things haphazardly, um, not to do things hastily, not to do things without thought, and then later regret it, because that's what this chapter will um, speak of and speak against. Um, so we'll jump into it. Um, Leviticus chapter 27, and we're, let's see how we can break this up. Let's do, um, Let's do the first uh, 10, first, no, first eight verses. First eight verses. Uh, who would like to read first? Go ahead. Uh, oh. Go All right. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Yisrael, and say unto them, When a man shall make a single vow, the persons shall be for Yahuwah by your estimation. And your estimation shall be of the male from 20 years old, even unto 60 years old. Even your estimation shall be 50 shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary. And if it be a female, then your estimation shall be 30 shekels. And if it be from five years old, even unto 20 years old, then your estimation shall be of the male 20 shekels and the female 10 shekels. And if it be from a month old, even unto five years old, then your estimation shall be of the male five shekels of silver 
And for the female, your estimation shall be three shekels of silver. And if it be from 60, I'm sorry, six years old and above. No, I was right. 60 years old and above. And it be a male, then your estimation shall be 15 shekels and for the female, 10 shekels. But if he be poor, then your estimation, then he shall present himself before the priest and the priest shall value him according to his ability to vow, to uh, ability that vow shall the priest value him. Interesting. I'm not really sure what it is that they're referring to here. Um, as far as the estimation, that's not something I've looked into, but it's interesting how he's, it's breaking this down. Um, let me uh, unstop the share here. Um, how he's breaking this down in as value for certain age groups and uh, different genders in those age groups. So I'm really interested to find out. I know this has to do with the vow, but you know, um, you know, to understand what it is that we're, we're we're really reading here is that we see these values and and but the what is it that that it is that we're you know that we're estimating. You know, what does that mean? What is that representing? So you got my attention, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, these these chapters, sometimes we dive into this area of, um, hold on one second. Sorry about that. Um, so one of the things that uh, we have to look at in regards to <clears throat> what this is talking about is a voluntary service. Um, these are promises made to Elohim in dedicating yourself for service. Now, for service, um, there was one family that was selected, right? We know that was the Levitical Levi Levites, the Levitical priesthood. So no one else could um, actually do work or service inside the temple or tabernacle. So this was a way in offering and dedicating a service in, in form of monetary value so that things could be taken care of for the Levites. So the, the, the purpose of the value, um, the estimation was the value of the person. This wasn't saying that men are worth more than women or this age was worth more than this age. This was saying the value placed on the person was relative to the work that they could perform. So a man would be much stronger uh, than a woman and value because they could lift heavier things. They could move things. They could, you know, work longer. So in that case, um, this was the order in which uh, we talked about, uh, it talks about uh, the value, uh, whether it be the shekels, which were uh, looked at in weekly wages, monthly wages, and yearly wages. So, but the focus here is making a promise and not reneging on it. Matter of fact, it's more so looking at um, looking at a value in what you offer, but then deciding you made a mistake in offering and wanting it back. Right. So we're going to get into some of those trade-offs, you know, when it comes to the animals and when it comes to the worth. Um, but I want to look at some passages to kind of break this down. Um, so you were able to redeem yourself with money, right? So let's look at uh, what David says in 2 Samuel chapter 24. David did not want to present himself with 
free. He wanted to make sure that whatever he did for Yah, whatever he did in service for Yah, cost him something. It says in verse 24, chapter 40, 24, then the king said to Aranua, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price, nor will I offer burnt offerings to Yahuwah, my Elohim, with that which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built an altar to, to Yahuwah and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So Yahuwah he, heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. So everything that they offered was worth something. So if you offered yourself for service voluntarily, you redeemed yourself back by paying the price that your work was worth to the Levites for them to carry out service. In other words, it was their payment for the service that they were doing. You couldn't actually actually do the work, but you could offer yourself and redeem yourself back for the price that you were worth. That's what's going on here. Kind of kind of a strange, you know, practice, you know, something that, you know, kind of you know, seems seemingly comes from nowhere. Um, but it is a way to 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 make payment for service for Yah. Um, and let's look at a few other uh, uh, promises because you're you're making this promise to Elohim uh, for service, and it's essential that it be fulfilled. If we look at um, Deuteronomy chapter 23, looking at verse 21, let's start in verse 21, Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21. When you make a vow to Yahuwah, your Elohim, you shall not to delay to pay for it. For Yahuwah, your Elohim, will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you. But if you abstain from vowing, it will not be sin to you. That which has gone from your lips, you shall keep and perform for your voluntary vow to Yahuwah, your Elohim, what you have promised with your mouth. So, again, this is a volunt This is something you're offering. This is something you see a need for. This is something you're volunteering. So you're promising yourself, knowing that it requires a fee to pay for the service that you would you would have provided by what the work that you would be able to do. So this is saying, you know, don't don't hesitate something that you volunteer. Give it much thought before you volunteer to do it because you know it's gonna cost you something. You guys with me? It's gonna cost you something. And what it costs, you have to pay immediately because if you make this vow and you do not pay it back, it will be sent to you. But if you don't make a vow, if you don't offer, because it's voluntar voluntarily given, it is not sent to you. So, so here you have a situation where the people are giving freely. It's a free will offering that you're giving for service. You want to help. You want to do something. You want to help with ministry. You want to, you know, you see someone else, you know, getting fruits of their labor and you want to join that, but you don't really think, put much thought to it. Right? And then you regret it. So, so let me let me let, let's kind of bring this home a little bit. Let's look at Acts chapter five, and, and I'm going to give you an idea of what's going on here. Um, because just to just to read it, remember we talked about this morning. Just to read some of the things we look at in Leviticus could be of no value if you don't understand what you're what it's talking about, right? So let's give let's give a picture 
of what's happening here. So in Acts chapter five, uh, sorry, verse one, it says, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold his possessions and he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife also being aware of it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Ruach and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remains, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to Elohim. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, um, Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, how is it that you agreed together to test the Ruach of, 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 of the master? Look, the feet, look, the feet of those buried with your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell at his feet and breathed her last. So we see clearly here that something, something compelled Ananias and Sapphira to offer something. So, so what is this about? So remember the day of Pentecost, um, Shavuot, all of the people uh, came to Jerusalem uh, to, to celebrate the feast. The Ruach came down. And all of these people, some coming from other nations, other countries, from afar, decided they wanted to stay in Jerusalem and live. So they decided to have all things in common. People started making offerings. People started giving things, selling their property, making sure people had clothes, had food. And what happens in chapter at the end of chapter four, Barnabas in verse thirty six, which was which uh, which was translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here, Ananias and Sapphira see that he's getting you know recognition for for giving truly from his heart for the people that need it, they want to emulate that, but not really. <laughs> they want the accolades from giving, but they want to hold back the, the, worth, the full worth of what they sold, which was not being truthful to the Ruach, which was a sin, right? That's what we just discussed. Like if you don't give, it's not a sin. But if you give and you hold back or you don't want to pay, it is a sin to you. So in like in like manner, this is what they, this is what's being practiced by the Levites there. They're giving for all of the people to have things in common so they wouldn't go without. Ananias and Sapphira try to do the same thing, but they cheat and don't give the full value. And Yahuwah says he will come and, and get what is required if you make a vow to him and not pay. Um, another passage in Proverbs. I see you, Stefan. I'll come to you in a second. In Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 25. It says this, it is a snare for man to devote rashly something as holy and afterward to reconsider his vow. So we are not to take making a vow to Yahuwah lightly. 
to offer ourselves for service lightly and then to renege and say, no, this is not for me. Nah, you made a vow to do something. You made a promise. It's voluntary. This isn't something it required. It's voluntary. You volunteered to be of service. You volunteered to give an offering, but you reneged. And, and Yah is saying, keep your promises. Don't make promises and then not keep them. So hopefully that opens it up kind of um, so that we can start to understand what we're seeing and what we're reading here as far as the people, because now we're going to go from offering themselves as a service and for redemption, given the payment, to making offerings of animals and of land um, and, and all that is required in regards to that. Stefan and then Rick. Hallelujah. Shalom, brother of the ride, Mishpaka. <laughs> Um, the, one of the scriptures that you mentioned, scriptural references that you pointed out earlier, was that Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes, I didn't five. read the Ecclesiastes passage, but there is a passage, Ecclesiastes 5 2. You have that up? Yeah, I do. Go um, ahead, read that. All right. Uh, okay, I'll, yeah, I'll read it. All right, so it says, um, guard your steps when you go into the house of Elohim and draw near to, to listen. Than to give the slaughtering of fools, for they do not know that they do evil. Do not be hasty with your mouth, and let not your heart hurry to bring a word before Elohim, for Elohim is in the Shamaim, and you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few, for a dream comes through greatness of tasks, and the fool's voice is known by his many words. When you make a vow to Elohim, do not delay to pay it, for he takes no pleasure in fools. Pay that which you have vowed. It is better not to vow than to vow and not pay. And do not allow your mouth to cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of Elohim that it was a mistake. Why should Elohim be wroth with your voice and destroy the work of your hands? Absolutely. Praise Yah. That, that coincides exactly with what we're discussing here. Yeah. Hallelujah. So... This is the actual, so yeah, so also in First Corinthians, I wanted to, um, I, well, I see that, that Paul was bringing out the same principle um, in regards to himself in, in, in First Corinthians uh, 9, which you mentioned earlier as well. Uh, First Corinthians 9, 16 to 19, I see the same, same principle being played out where it says, uh, for if I bring the good news, it is no boasting for me, for necessity is laid upon me. And it is woe to me if I do not bring the good news. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. But if I, if not voluntarily, I am trusted with a management. What then is my reward that in bringing the good news, I should offer the good news of Mashiach without cost, so as not to abuse my authority and the good news. And then special emphasis on 19, for though I am free from all, I made myself a servant to all in order to win more. Absolutely, absolutely. So we're, we're looking at this whole picture of being compelled versus obligation and volunteering. He's saying he's not obligated to, but he is volunteering to that that in that way, the vow that he's making, <clears throat> he has to hold true to it. And that's what Yah is telling us in, in this chapter that, you know, we don't make, you know, these vows. We don't try to swindle, you know, our offerings. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is from the beginning, uh, 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 something that's not required, but something that the Hebrews are volunteering to do in service to Yah to help the Levitical priesthood. And we're gonna get into it more. But uh, yeah, good, great passages uh, to kind of bring out all of the aspects of what this is telling us even now. You know, sometimes, you know, we, we use the phrase, we, we bit off more than I can chew. You know, specifically when it comes to ministry, you know, we have, opportunities um, to be lights 
as Yah gives us utterance to help in ways that are that are strength that are our strength. You know, whether it's teaching, whether it's serving, whether it's administration, all of the gifts you can run down, Yah gives us, you know, the strength and the endurance to be able to take those things. But sometimes we get into our flesh and we want to do more than what he's required us to do. We want to do more than what he's asked us to do. And we volunteer our services or our our um yeah, our services for things that we can't hold up to, for things that we can't, you know, live up to, I should say. Um, and then it fails, the, the attempt fails. So it's better to to take much consideration, in our case, much prayer and thoughtful process before we volunteer our services for the kingdom, because it's vital to the life of all who don't know him. It's vital to the life of the body in general, because if you're volunteering to do something that requires you to do it, that means there's a weak spot if you don't carry it out, right? And, and that's what Yahuwah is telling us in the form of volunteering our service and making sure that we hold to the vow that we give to him. So um, praise Yah. Rick? Yeah. <clears throat> I think the, the thing that I was just, I just got a little clarity on, I was doing a little look at shekels, you know, what is that, what does that mean, you know, because, you know, most of us would think of it in a value of a dollar or something, you know what I mean, like a, like a tithe, that was mm -hmm. my first thought when, when we were going here, is that it was, you know, a value of like a tithe or something that you would have to give unto the Levite, you know, to help cover their, you know, their, their uh, pay and, uh, you know, uh, and as well as the needy and the widow. So it's almost in that same comparison. But when I look into the, what a shekel is, it's basically a weight, uh, uh, you know. So if we're looking at it, it's a weight that, uh, of, our, of our offering, you know, there's a value that we got to pay. So I'm guess I'm trying to correlate. Right. You so, know, that right. part. So the shekel, the shekel is the weight of your value. So in the case, um, shekels, were were attached to uh, silver. This was considered, you know, uh, a shekel being considered um, uh, 50 shekels would, would have been four years wages. So the weight of your value to your offering was given and that's what you had to pay. So the work that you weren't capable of doing and what would, would it be worth for the time frame is what you would pay. That's why it says for um, your value shall be 50 shekels, which is a four years wages of silver, according to the shekel of the, of the sanctuary. If it is a female, then your valuation is 30 shekels. So her weight and value for four years wages would have been 30 shekels. So that's what it's uh, speaking of. So how does that correlate to us today as far as uh, making a vow? As a, a vow is meaning like doing something for the kingdom, like teaching or, or you know, leading something in that, in that regard. Is that, you know, doing things for the kingdom in that sense, right. you know? Um, you know, uh, and then how does that correlate to that value of that shekel today for us if that's the same thing and we're looking at this, where do I fit in this scale of, you know, men or, or women and age groups? And then, okay, that values there. How does that correlate to us today? And so that, you know, if I, if I understand this, uh, then maybe it'll, it'll bring a deeper understanding to the vow that I've made for what I'm doing now, you know, uh, you know, where, where, where he's brought to me in the experience that I had in 11, 11, 11, where, you know, this would establish my movement towards him and, you know, doing the things that I'm doing today. There was a vow that was made unto him, you know, when I understood what he called me to do, you know, I had that. So that's why sometimes that's what keeps me going when I don't necessarily sometimes want to, you know what I'm saying? It's because of that. Now, is there a, is there a value, a dollar value that I'm supposed to 
because there's no Levites now. So, you know, right. is there so, a value right. So, to, so, you know? right. No, you're absolutely right. So, so contemporarily, this completely speaks of the Levitical priesthood in the way in which the community was living. So you, you, you have that correlation specifically dealing with them. For us, you know, in, in the form of giving, we still give, you know, we still give, we can pledge to give, say for instance, you know, there's a family in need, you know, and, you know, the elders ask the fellowship, listen, you know, so, such and such a family is going through something, you know, we don't have the money because the people haven't been given. So the, would any family like to give this amount so that they can take care of us and so? Family pledges $200. When it comes time to give, they don't give it. <laughs> it's better that you didn't make the pledge, you know, than to make the pledge, make the vow that you're promising to give this family that's in need and then hold back. That's why I read the passage in Acts because the families that were around, the people that were around had a need. And the Nice and Sapphira decided they weren't going to give the need that they volunteered to give. Now, Somebody could possibly be without. So I'm going to hold you to it. And the recompense for what you didn't give is your life. And they both dropped dead. So, so it does correlate in the, in, in the sense that we still have to make sure that when we're, we're volunteering and we're, 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 we're making a vow to Yah to do something for someone or something within the kingdom to hold ourselves to it. That, that can be ministry. That can say, you know, Rick, you know, Jadiel, you know, every Shabbat, you know, when I'm able, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach Leviticus. I know you're doing that. And I know, Jadiel, you're doing that. And then every week, I don't show up. But brother, you, you, do you really, do you really want to lead this? Do you really want to teach? Can you teach it? You know, I'm not talking about every now and then taking off for for whatever reason, sick or whatever, family coming over. You know, I'm talking about obligated, voluntarily obligating myself to do something that we discuss that will help the kingdom. If we don't have time to do it, if we can't do it, don't volunteer to do it. You know, it has it's it, it doesn't say anything about you know sometimes getting weary because sometimes we get weary in doing well. But we push forward and Yahuwah refills us. So that's a complete difference. That's a flip side of that coin. So um, so I hope that helps um, in making sense to how we correlate the principle of dedicating ourselves for Yah's service, because that's what they're doing. Dedicating themselves, dedicating their animals, their land for use of the kingdom. So we're going to talk about that too. Um, Sister... Marlo, and then Brother Stefan. Hi, um, I was like wondering, now at first I wasn't going to say anything, but you guys kept talking. I'm like, okay, it keeps coming back up. So I'm going to ask the question because it sounds like in a spiritual sense, like the a correlation between the contract that we, we've made as Yasharel with our father like when they said, yes, we will do it. That was almost like, was that like making a vow there? When they said, yes, we will do it. And then they didn't. And then the consequences. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that, that was a vow. Um, but that was, that was a vow in terms of being in the nation. Like there was a requirement to be in that covenant, right? This here is not something that's necessarily required. This is something that he's given the people an opportunity to do. So it's like saying, you know, um, Assembly of Yahuwah, um, you know, everybody that is capable, you know, sell your house <laughs> and give all the proceeds to us. Um, and uh, if you're able, right? But you're not able. Not only do you not own your house, you, you're renting and you're selling something that you can't sell or 
you sell your house because you want to fit in with everybody else, but now you don't have a place to live. You don't really have the money to be able to do it. It's a voluntarily voluntary. So, so by volunteering a service that they could not provide, they're actually sinning against Yah. He's saying, I'd rather you not say that you're going to give anything to me. I'd rather you not make a vow to me if you can't fulfill it. So fulfill the promise that you're going to give. If I promise my wife that I'm going to be her husband, then I need to be her husband. Not Jane, Mary, and Karen's husband too, right? I'm vowing to be her husband. That has consequences if that's violated. I violate that vow, right? Vows are very important. You know, it's it's scriptures all through. Uh, Stefan just read a good one. You make a vow, stick to it. Don't fall back on it. Don't break it. Specifically, when you're volunteering to do it. And Ananias and Sapphira did not have to sell their house. But they wanted to be like um, Barnabas. They wanted the recognition of Barnabas. They wanted to appear like they had wealth, right? And they hold back some of what the house was worth and not give the full value, which was a slap in the face of the Ruach. So, praise God. Um, Stefan and then um, Sister Diane. Praise Yahuwah. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit more scriptural backing to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. That's more emphasis. Um, in Matthew 5, verse 33 to uh, 37, it says, and again, you heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to Yahuwah. But I say to you, do not swear falsely at all, neither by the Shamaim, because it is Elohim's throne, nor by the earth, for it is the footstool, nor by Yerushalayim, for it is the city of the great sovereign, nor swear by your head because you are not able to make one hair white or black, but let your word be yes, be, let your word yes be yes and your no be no. And what goes behind the, uh, beyond these is from the wicked one. So like <clears throat> your vow always has to be intentional um, and for it to be intentional, there must be understanding. Um, you know, as is mentioned and, and as we read in uh, Ecclesiastes 5, like you have to be prudent when approaching Elohim um, with everything that you do. There has to be understanding because you don't accept vows or uh, anything from, from, a full, from a foolish state. <clears throat> um, there, uh, man, I kind of lost my thought, but <laughs> kind of lost my thought. That's okay, brother. You're doing well. Yeah, it was. Oh, there we go. So, like, you have to, like, uh, brother, I was saying, you have to consider like all the options because there's a cost. There's a there's a cost to what you're vowing. It's going to cost you something, and it's also going to affect um, another, um, depending on the vow that you're making. But it has to be. You have to understand as well on um, that this cost should not, you know, if you choose to to. Uh, and if you intentionally choose to still vow, um, with knowing this cost and having this understanding, you know, you will get to a point like where Paul got and where most of the, uh, where, you know, I'm going to just say Paul. In Philippians uh, 4, 4, 11 and 13, where he says, not that I speak concerning the need, for I have learned to be content in whatever state I am. I know what it is to be humble and I know what it is to have in excess in any and all have learned both to be filled and to be hungry, both to have in excess and to be in need. For I have the strength to do it all through Amashiach who empowers me. Um, yeah. Praise God. And, and, and see, see the, the beautiful thing about that passage you just read is that it, 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 it stretches the whole gambit. It, stretch, it stretches to one that is giving and volunteering to give because of excess. He has, he can freely give, he has it to give. He doesn't personally need it. Or one that is totally in faith and says, I'm gonna go ahead and give this knowing that Yahoo is gonna provide. I'm not gonna do it grudgingly. I'm gonna give cheerfully. 
And, and that's where we have to be in our mindset. He doesn't want us to make rash vows and then have afterthoughts and regret giving. You know, we're gonna go into the animals in the land that are gonna all speak the same thing. You know, uh, I wanna give half my flock, you know, because I saw Joe give half his flock. But uh, if I give half my flock, I'm gonna be broke. Like if you if you gonna give half your flock, give half your flock. Let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. Don't halt between two opinions. Scripture is continues to carry that same thought. Serve Yah or serve Baal. You know, you're lukewarm. You're sitting on the fence. You're neither hot nor cold. That is frowned upon by the Father. That is frowned upon by the Son. So we have to make sure that our vows are true to what the Ruach is telling us to do. Listen to your Ruach. Praise Yah. Good passages, Stefan. Um, Sister Diane and then Sister Victoria. Hallelujah, hallelujah. This is beautiful. And uh, yes, uh, Brother Stefan read a couple of the passages that I had written down. So um, beautiful. I would just continue to elaborate on that. And that is, you know, Yah is, uh, is teaching us how to be like him. You know, he is teaching us him because he has given his promises and his promises does not go out void. You know, he's teaching us honesty. He's teaching us truth. You know, he's teaching us how to give in faith, you know, as he is, he has given to us, you know, he has even shown us what faith is, you know, he's shown us the rewards of honoring him. You know, once again, um, this Leviticus is all about the law, but it's also about understanding who our Yahuwah is. Everything that he has example to us, um, he gives us a chance to example it back to him. You know, he gives us a chance to learn the laws and to, you know, to learn the ways of living. He has given to us ways to learn what it is to be um, Kodesh, to be set aside. And that is what is so beautiful about this entire book of Leviticus. And he includes everything, our land, you know, our, our animals, our children. And I like uh, what you brought out, Brother Rod, in terms of... Um, this particular chapter deals with dedication, you mm. know, vows in terms of dedication. As you say, there are different types of vows, you know, and this one here is dedication. The temple has to be cared for. Uh, we, we know that the Levites did not go out and work per se, you know, and there were things that had to be done, you know, taking care of that temple. Uh, they were the ones that did the actual sacrifices but what about other things i mean candles and they may have even made the candles did they do the oil you know did they make that oil or was the oil brought in what did someone dedicate uh 30 you know 30 shekels to promise two months worth of picking olives you know is the way uh this thing could be looked at you know they dedicated part of their labor for the service of the tabernacle and you know and you know that's what this chapter kind of deals with another thing that really you brought out was how does this apply to us in this day and age brother rick was saying well you know how, you know how does this apply you use the word pledge and um, that's it, you know, we, we don't necessarily go out and give a, a month's wages to, uh, for picking olives or whatever, but, you know, if we worked in a vineyard and we did pick olives, we can dedicate part of our wages um, through a pledge, you know, to our um, assembly, you know, to our, um, 
church and for lack of a better word you know to say i'm going to give you know as you mentioned to give to a family mm -hmm. you know that's in need or whatever i have dedicated part of my wages or we could say shekels you know even though the um, you know like if i make a hundred dollars and that's my paycheck or whatever um that wasn't necessarily for the tab the tabernacle you see what i'm saying but i have pledged part it's a pledge i have pledged part of my income for this family you know the church needs a new roof you know uh the assembly needs to get their internet bill paid you know this type of thing you know it's a pledge to keep you know uh the service of y'all who are going so um i like the way all of that ties in amen absolutely sis you said a lot and you you, <laughs> you really got you got me almost wanting to tell the end because you said a few things that that lead me to the full combination because remember this is the this this dedicated for service comes at the very end of the book of holiness how to be holy, how to be set apart and live in that holiness in the character of Yah. But it says something even more, and you almost went there, but we're going to go there at the end um, just so we can completely see what this is about. It's a vow that we're keeping. Hallelujah. But there's a reason why we're obligated to keep that vow, and I'll get to that at the end, but Praise you Everything you said, you, Stefan, uh, Sister Marlo, um, and, and most definitely Brother Rick are right on point in leading us to fully understand what is required of us. Praise you Sister Victoria, and then we'll pick up the reading. Shalom, Elder. Shalom. Um, I, just wanted, I just wanted to mention, since we're in this study, um, where we live here in Tennessee, nearby, there's a town called Pulaski, and there's a large group of brothers and sisters. They're called the 12 tribes. They have locations throughout this country and in Europe. And before you join them, you have to uh, make, you know, give up everything. You give them, you sell your house, your possessions, your bank account, whatever, and you give it to them, but they take care of each other. And, you know, I was a little skeptical at first, but they have a restaurant here that's very nice and the food's clean. And if you eat meat, it's kosher. And, and I've gotten to know a couple of the ladies that work there. And, you know, I've kind of to the side going, are you really happy in this Hong? Have you been in it? And they, they love it, you know, and I can see the benefits because these older ladies and widows and older gentlemen in it, they're taken care of. They don't have to worry about anything. They, they're loved and they have a community outreach on Friday nights. I'm not saying it's something for me. I just, I'm impressed with how they take care of each other. I just think it's a really beautiful thing and um, to see it actually in action and know some of the people that are involved in it and they keep the feast and they keep the Shabbat. And when the customers come in, whether they're believers or not, you can see the love and the kindness. And um, it's just a really beautiful thing. And I just wanted, I just made me think of that since we're just talking about the book of Acts and the sharing. So anyway, thank you. Absolutely. You know, there are, there absolutely are communities that exhibit um, all of the characteristics of community living. Um, and when done properly, it's a beautiful thing. Sure. Um, but there are also cases where it's, it's a cult and people are taking advantage of other people and they're taking everything from them, but keeping everything for themselves and then giving rules and regulations that benefit the ones at the top. So got to be careful with those little communities because it's not always cracked up what it's made out to be. But when it's done properly, according to scripture, it most definitely could be a beautiful thing. I, I agree with you, sister. Um, Brother Rick. Yeah, part of what I was going to say is what you just said, you know, but, you know, we look at scripture from the beginning. That was what Yahuwah's plan was, really, um, is for the community to provide for the community. That's what, yeah. that's what, that's uh, what these roles are, right? Yep. 
Yeah, you know, that's what the tithing was about too. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it, you know, the, you see these scriptures in Malachi. You know, you you bring your tithe to the storehouse and 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 improve me, show me that it doesn't overflow. You know, basically, he's he's telling us that if we if we were to do it in this manner, which is one of the goals that that I have for this ministry at some point, is for us to be able to get to a point where we can have. Uh, uh, our own community property, if you will, where we can begin to, to live in that sense. But, um, you know, you, you, you know, you, if you, if we were to get back into that kind of mindset that we are to care for one another, you know, to make sure that there's nobody that goes without, that has needs, you know what I'm saying? That's, that's Yahuwah's heart. That's his love for his people. That's the provisions and all these structures that are put in place he took care of his Levites, even though they didn't collect the salary. They didn't go work. They were working for him. And yep. therefore, yep. you know, if you're if they're taking care of his temple and and and, and Yahuwah's work, then his community, therefore, is supporting one another. They're supporting the Levites, which then again take care of the needy and the widows and the orphans. You know, all of that stuff all comes into fruition. It's all completed. Uh, and, and it's a beautiful thing, but the world's got away from that. But I believe that the word says we're going to come back to that. And I think that that's on the hearts of the people. And that's why you see it, all these communities starting to pop up and try to do that. But you're right. We got to be cautious about who we trust and, you know, and how they do things. You know, you don't want to get into that cultish type of an environment, yeah. but a community environment where we're all on the same page and doing work, looking for each other. That's that's yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. You know, you know, some, and, and you're right. Some of those communities, they start off beautiful. Oh, yeah. This is lovely. Yeah, come on in. You know what I mean? Yeah, oh, everything is for everybody. And then, bam! You know what I mean? <laughs> what? 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 You know what I mean? It's just, you're in a black hole, you know? Um, so that's truth, man. That's that's what happens in some of these communities. But, you know, definitely don't want to take for granted, you know, what Sister Victoria is sharing, uh, where she's witnessing these people actually doing it properly. So that's a beautiful thing. Very, very good wisdom, uh, Brother Rick, uh, that you shared as well. All right, let's pick up. Let's um, let's read the next several verses. Let's go from verse nine, and we'll stop at twenty-five. Verse nine to twenty-five. Who wants to take that? Uh, Brother Devlon, Sister Wendy. Hey, Shabbat Shalom. Hey, brother. Uh, I'll be reading from the um, Tree of Life version. You said nine through twenty-five. What did you say? What version? Uh, Tree of Life. That's the one of my family has, so it'll be oh, easier yeah. for. No problem. Yeah. Go ahead. Nine now, to if, twenty-five. Yes. You got it. Thank you. Now, if it is an animal that may be brought as an offering to Yahuwah, anything that one gives to Yahuwah will be holy. He is not to replace it or exchange it, either good for bad or bad for good. But if he does exchange one animal for another, then both it and the one for which it is exchanged will become holy. Mm. If it is any sort of unclean animal that may not, <clears throat> that may not be bought, brought as an offering to Yahuwah, then he is to set that animal before the Kohen. The Kohen is to evaluate it, whether it is good or bad. As the Kohen values it, so it will be. But if he would redeem it, then he is to add a fifth to its valuation. If a man consecrates his house as holy to Yahuwah, then the Kohen is to evaluate it, whether it is good or bad. As the Kohen evaluates it, so it will stand. If the one who dedicates it would redeem his own house, then he is to add a fifth of the money of your valuation to it, and it will become his. If one consecrates to Yahuwah part of the field of his possession, then your valuation is to be in proportion to the seed to sow it, an omer of barley at 50 shekels of silver. If he dedicates his field from the year of Jubilee, it will be according, it will stand according to your own valuation. But if he dedicates his field after the Jubilee, then the Kohen is to calculate for him the money according to the years 
that remain until the year of Jubilee with a deduction to be made from your valuation. <clears throat> he who dedicated the field would ever, well, he who dedicated the field would ever redeem it, then he is to add a fifth of the money of your valuation to it, and it will remain his. But if he will not redeem the field, or if he has sold the field to someone else, it may not be redeemed anymore. But the field, when it is released in the Jubilee, will be holy to Yahuwah as a consecrated field. It will be owned by the Kohanim. Now, if one consecrates to Yahuwah a field that he has bought, which is not from the field of his possession, then the Kohen is to calculate for him the worth of your valuation up to the year of Jubilee and give your valuation on that day as a holy thing to Yahuwah. In the year of Jubilee, the field is to return to the one from whom it was bought, to the one to, the one to whom the possession of the land belongs. All your valuations should be according to the shekel of the sanctuary, Tunigeras to the shekel. Praise God. Anything stand out to you? Mm. Uh, let's see. So uh, it's so weird because I had I feel like I had a full understanding of one through eight. So I'm like, okay, so the rest of this as well. Um, though I lack understanding, I guess, when it comes to this, though That's I do see different. that things are a bit different uh -huh. with the Jubilee as opposed to um redeeming something that was dedicated as well, um, on a regular day, I guess. Um so I am seeing that if someone wants to take back what they dedicated, you add a fifth of its value. Um, but I guess that goes back into, you know, maybe this should be for careful thinking if you want to dedicate something. Don't just do it out of like, you know, the right. emotional high of the moment, spur of the moment. And it's like, you know, when I have to pay a little bit more. But yeah, that's all I've got for this so far. No, that was very good, brother. That was very good. You know, the <laughs> the mention of Jubilee was to add even more to it because the less, um, the closer to the year of Jubilee you got, the less it will be worth because it was coming right back to you, right? Everything returned back to its owner. The more time in between um, the year of Jubilee and the time that you that you offered the land, the, the more of the value the more value we have because you would have more time. Um, but you're absolutely right. This was to bring clarity to what Yah is telling them that they are not to make these rash decisions in offering something. You offer a lamb, um, but but you but you want to trade it because the one the one that you that you have is is actually less worth than the other one. So you try to switch it. Yah says now you owe me both of them. Right. You know, they had this thing where the, the staff would be held up and the lambs would walk by and the, the priest would get every 10th lamb. But if that lamb was better and you wanted to give a lesser lamb and you tried to hold it back, then he would get both of those. So um, it's trying to teach principle as well. It's, it's saying, you know, not only stay true to the vows that you make but be honest in all of your dealings with your animals and with your land. If you're given, you know, an animal that is, you know, not clean, which cannot be sacrificed, right? Because all the clean animals are going to be sacrificed. Then there was a price to pay to redeem it. Otherwise, that, that animal will be used for whatever it's worth, to till the ground, to, to do whatever was necessary that the animal will be used from. So, this is teaching them principle, along with staying true to their vows, being honest in everything and all ways that they're dealing. You know, a lot of talk about community living. <laughs> you had to be honest in the community that you were living in. Everything was based upon you being true and showing the true character of Yah. So you did a good job in explaining it, brother, even though it kind of confused you a little bit, but you 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 held the principle in your understanding of what you shared. Um, brother Rick. Yeah, bravo, brother. That was good. Um, I want to share this again. Um, 
because of the LF Tavs in here, I, mm -hmm. I, I, just, I see them, whoops, I put it up without sharing it. Um, again, here, when we see this, these placements of the LF Tav in here, and we can see how they're speaking. Some of this was really, really deep when we get down in here about the, with the Jubilees and um, if it's yours or it's not and you're selling it, or if you do sell it to another man that it, you can't even redeem it back anymore. Those are pretty deep, but let's take a look at these uh, left tops because they, they, they bring more emphasis to this because we see here in 11 is their first, first uh, look at it when it says, and if any unclean beast, of which they do not offer a sacrifice unto Yahuwah, then he shall present a left top of the beast before the priest. So it's even talking about an unclean animal here, which I never would have thought to see that in here. But now we see that it, because it's presented like a, as an offering, or there's a covenant there that, that that is now attached to it in somehow that now has to be brought to the priest. And then the priest will value it, whether it's good or bad. And then... Um, we see in 14 again, uh, uh, when a man shall sanctify a left top of his house, you know, so now you're, now you're dedicating your house, you're set, you're, you're offering this unto him, uh, being kadosh unto Yahuwah because you've offered it to him, be, uh, to be a set apart unto him. Then the priest shall estimate it, whether it's good or bad as the priest shall estimate it. So shall it stand. Uh, that, that's pretty amazing. Again, he's bringing his priest into this once it's sanctified uh, or it's offered unto Yahuwah to even to determine if it's good or bad because it's being uh, uh, like a covenant offering that's being offered to Yahuwah. Right, right. The priests have to be involved in this to, to make sure that it is something that's acceptable and good. Uh, and then we see 15 and, and that sanctified it will redeem a left out of this house. Uh, then he, then even then he has to add a part to it, which you guys talked about earlier which means that we got to be wise about it, even when we're doing it and dedicating it unto him, but we still should be able to redeem that even, and, but we got to add more to it. I wonder why the fifth is added in there. Uh, that's, that's an interesting thought that I had too, that I see here, you know, these type of numbers, you know, the fifth or even the 50. Um, and then the next one we see is an 18, you know, where he sanctified his field after the Jubilee, then the priest shall reckon it uh, unto him a left top of the money according to the years that remain. So again, we see there's that covenant that's involved in even the uh, the value because we understand a jubilee. There's a couple things involved with the jubilee. One is it's reckoned back to the owner, but it's also uh, freeing from uh, a burden of debt. So you know it's interesting how all of these things are connected and and are put in here. We see again in 19, and if he sanctified a left top of the field, uh, uh, will any uh, uh, wise de uh, redeem it? Then again, he has to add that money. And we see that it's connected to this, a left top is connected to it like it was before about redeeming it. And how that fifth is a part of that again. 20, we see this uh, again. And if he will not redeem a left top of the field, or if he sold a left top of the field to another man, and it shall not be redeemed, interesting placement in those two things if you're giving it unto somebody or, uh, or you're dedicating this right it, uh this field it, this uh, it has this covenant to it but if you sell it then it's not redeemed anymore what is that because the covenant now is known void void Inter i don't know but i just i just really see how these really bring another level even in 22 and if a man sanctified unto yahuwah a left top uh, a field which he has bought which is not the field of his possession so he's not owner of that right then the priest shall reckon unto him a left top the worth of the estimation of value even unto the year of jubilee and he shall give a left top your estimation on that day so again covenant 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 all this is in here and it and it really i just see that it's we seeing values being put they're sanctified by yahuwah and, and by the people making the, this a vow, so a vow in a way is something that is of yours that you're vowing, you're, you're making a covenant with Yahuwah, right? Uh, in that sense, is it's, it's all connected into that. So I don't know, that's really deep stuff when I'm seeing that and I see these jubilees in there and how 
the priests are involved in this and giving estimations and values and how the fifth and the 50th, you know, uh, I have to look into those more because that caught my attention. And I just, I just think that there's a little bit more depth there that I want to gain, but that's, that's deep. And I, I think it's good for us to examine. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of, um, uh, a lot of what goes into understanding this chapter also requires that you understand what came previously. So, you know, the year of Jubilee, remember the year of Jubilee, everything, all debts were forgiven, all land went back to its uh, previous owner, right? So that you knew when you bought it, you were having it for a period of time. That's why it suggests um, to make sure that you understand the time frame where you are in reference to the year of Jubilee because the land is worth more if there's more time in between the time you're selling it versus, you know, Jubilee is in six months. So I'm gonna sell you this property. Probably is gonna be a little less because the man wants to get his work. Also what went into it because the family had the right to own the property that was in their family. It, it was perpetually part of the family. But if you sold it to another person and it wasn't redeemed by the family, then it went back to the priest or to its original owner. And sometimes that meant that the family would be totally, totally discluded from owning that property. So this was to also protect the community and inheritances that were passed down to the family. So Yah's making provision for everything, everything we can think. If we want to cheat, you know, we want to sell an animal, but really he's got a, 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 a a, 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 a white a, a white spray paint over a black blemish on his body. You know what I mean? And you don't figure it out till you get it. You know, he's 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 ref making you refrain from even having the mindset of cheating or being dishonest or not uh, holding to a vow that you promised. It's all about, like we talked in the beginning, holiness and being set apart in expressing and exhibiting the character of Yah himself. That's what this is. This is living in a community that is set forth instructions for a set of our people. So um, good stuff, everyone. Um, Brother Stefan. Shalom. Um, can you give me a little bit more of an example um, for verse 14? Um, when it talks verse about 14. Kodai consecrating the house on how in regards to the priests as well um determining if it's you know good or not how all of this looks like what does that look like and uh scripturally backing if, if you can if possible <clears throat> all right so verse 14 says and when a man dedicates his house to be holy to yahuwah then the priest shall set a value for it, whether it is good or bad, as the priest values it, it shall stand. So a priest could set a value on a house um, given to fulfill a vow. So he could look at the house and he could say, okay, it's, it's in a walled city. So this house is, a is worth a little bit more than a city sitting in the middle of a village that has no walls, it's more protected, you know, it's a little bit more value, right? And whatever he sets the value of that house, that price would stand. And it also had to do with the inheritance, um, or if it wasn't an, a part of an inheritance of a family, um, because remember, it would go back to priest, if you didn't redeem it, the priest would keep it. So that's, that's an example of that. Um, what else was, what was the other question? Well, oh, that was it. Yeah, I think that that was it. But also how, how oh, and by the way, thank you. Um, look at, look at verse, um, look at verse 29. Oh, we'll get into that. Uh, no, we'll talk about that later. Um, oh, let's look at uh, the previous chapter. Chapter 25, verse 29, I think 29 and 
All right, chapter 25, verse 29 says, if a man sells a house in a walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after it is sold within a full year, he may redeem it. But if it is not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house in the walled city shall belong permanently to him who bought it. Throughout his generations, it shall not be released in the year of Jubilee. So this, this, this came with an understanding that the value would be brought forth by the priests, but it couldn't be redeemed in a year of Jubilee. And if it did, you didn't redeem it, then it would go back um, to its owner. So that's, uh, that's kind of the commentary. So that's why understanding what we read before about what's in the um, what's in the city uh, will, will be a little bit more will be worth a little bit more um, based upon the structure of the particular area. Um, walled cities provided more security, um, so the houses would be valued at more versus one out in the wilderness. Um, so, what happened? Did you guys lose me? No, we hear you. Okay. Um, but if it is not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house in the walled city shall belong permanently to him who bought it throughout his generations. So, you couldn't wait to the year of Jubilee to get your house back. If you wanted your house back, you had to pay the redemption price. If you didn't pay the redemption price and you tried to wait for the year of Jubilee for it to be returned, then you would lose it to the person that you sold it to. So that's pretty much what this is referring to here in verse 14. So that. Great job. All right. Let's... um. Let's finish up the chapter. Um, and we'll talk about a few things here. It says, but the firstborn of the animals. All right, so let, let's 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 give an understanding here. So the what we just discussed were redeemable things, right? Things we could redeem. What we're about to go into now. Are, are things that could not be redeemed. And there's a reason why they can't be redeemed. So let's look at it. Sorry, in verse 26, it says, but the firstborn of the animals, which should be Yahuwah's firstborn, no man shall dedicate, whether it is an ox or sheep, it is Yahuwah's. And if it is an unclean animal, then he shall redeem it according to your valuation and shall add one fifth to it. Or if it is not redeemed, then it shall be sold according to your valuation. Verse 28, nevertheless, no devoted offering that a man may devote to Yahuwah all that he has, both man and beast or the field of his possessions shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering is most holy to Yahuwah. No person under the band um, who may become doomed to destruction among men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is Yahuwah's. It is holy to Yahuwah. If a man wants at all to be redeemed any of his tithes, he shall add one fifth to it. And concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock of whatever passes under the rod, that's what we were talking about earlier, under the rod, a tenth one shall be holy to Yahuwah. So the tenth um, herd, the tenth of the flock passing by the rod of the shepherd or the, or the, uh, the uh, priest, the tenth one should be uh, Yahuwah should go to the priest. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it, what we talked about earlier. And if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchange for it shall be holy, and it shall not be redeemed. 
you couldn't cheat <laughs> if you if you offered something and tried to hold back by switching it that too would go to Yahuwah. these are the commandments which Yahuwah commanded Moses for the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. So anyone want to take a stab at this before I uh, break it down a little bit? What we just read? Oh, Devlon, go ahead, brother. Um, so first and foremost, we know that um, I can't remember where, but we've read it before that um, the firstborn of, of course, your sons, but then the firstborn of your livestock belong to Yahuwah. So when it comes to dedication, um, yeah, you can't redeem any of that because it belongs to Yahuwah. Right. Um, most and there's a difference with the unclean animals because, I mean, in my head, I'm thinking maybe he doesn't want that anyway, but you know, that it's definitely of less value. Um, it can't be sacrificed or anything like that. It can be eaten. So that can be bought back or redeemed. And even if but, it isn't, it is be sold. To, right. You have to add a tip to it to buy it back. To redeem right, it. right. Because, yes, like anything, you know, you add value to something that you want to redeem. Um, and from the previous one, thanks, by the way, because I, I was thinking, like, what if someone is trying to take advantage of the Jubilee? But, you know, you cleared that up. So, you know, you can't take advantage of these things. You got to add more value to whatever it is that you're trying to get back. Right. Um, Quick scenario um, in what you just described in the firstborn, because uh, you, you were actually... Uh, you were right in saying that we read it earlier, Exodus chapter 13, consecrate to me, verse two, all of the firstborn, whatever opens a womb among children of Israel, both man and beast, it's mine. Devline, I'm going to borrow your car for a week, all right? I'll, I'll come back after week, Devline. Hey, Devline, I want to gift you this car. Here's the keys. Is that an <laughs> offering? No, you already own it. It's your car. That's what Yah is saying. You can't dedicate something that he already owns. You can't cheat Yah. You can't say, I'm going to offer up the firstborn of the cattle. Why? He already owns it. It already belongs to him. Offering an unclean animal that can't be sacrificed. You have to pay for that. Specifically, if you were only offering it because you knew that it couldn't be sacrificed, so you have to redeem it, you have to buy it back to use it for whatever you were going to use it for, but you got to add a fifth to it. You can't cheat this system that he has set up. Um, so, so good job. Go ahead, brother. You were still talking. Love it. Um, so there's also the um, can't redeem a person who has this death penalty going on, you know, whether that be for working on Shabbat or some of the other things that require being put to death. Um, so that's a no-go. Someone is sentenced to death that there's no if, ands, or buts about that. Um, something stood out to me about the tithes because, you know, grew up in church and stuff and so i'm clearly seeing i've seen it multiple times the tithes isn't specifically money it's some of you know the sea of the land and then the um livestock as well however i'm also a little confused now like wait there are certain tithes a person can get back so i'll need some clarity on that yeah so so <clears throat> absolutely um the principle of giving stands um We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but a follow-up scripture to what you just talked about as far as dedicating the firstborn, Exodus 34, um, verses 19 and 20 says, all that opens a womb are mine and every male firstborn among the livestock, whether ox or sheep, but the firstborn of the donkey shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem him, then you shall break its neck all the firstborn of the sons you shall redeem and none shall appear before me empty handed. So again, just following up the principle of the firstborn. So Devlon, you bring up something interesting. 
uh, we're going to get into it. So these unredeemable things, <clears throat> the first of the beasts, and then you brought up anything that Yah um, puts under a ban. And we'll look at that in, in the realm of um, spoils of war and then required tithes, you know, could not be redeemed. So I'm going to let JP go and then I'm going to go into some of these things with some scriptures. Go ahead, JP. Uh, no, I was just, you know, it, it's interesting that um, he says that, you know, I mean, for us, you know, we have our firstborn, you know, sheep, for instance. They're like our first sheep, you know, this is our first sheep. And we've already like, it's for, it's like in your heart already to be like, you couldn't do anything with these sheep. They're just going to live. Like, they're just going to, they're going to be the ones that will produce for you. They'll, you know, give you the wool or, you know, what, what not. And so you don't have that. I don't know. For me, I was just reading this. And I was like, it's interesting that I felt that way. Like, Yahuwah is like this. So like, and I'm just trying to picture myself in these times, um, especially during this time uh, we're reading in, and you would have that in you already. You say, this is my firstborn sheep. Like, and this is my thinking, okay? Like, this is my firstborn sheep. Like, I'm not going to take them up to go and be for an offering, but everything else, you know, can be. And that's how I was taking it. Um, and then the ones that, that are these first ones, they would just become their Yahuas. They're just his already. So I can, you know, just take care of them, you know. I don't know. And something like that. I just thought it was interesting as I was thinking about it. Just want to share that thought. Shalom. Yeah, absolutely. Um <clears throat> so let's look at a few of these things. <coughs> Devoted things. Um uh devoting a possession. <clears throat> was stronger than the act of dedication. Nothing devoted could be redeemed. Um, persons devoted or for people that were under a ban um, that were set to be put to death, like um, Brother Devlon brought out, um, could not be redeemed. Their, their, their fate was already doomed. Um, but verse 28, nevertheless, no devoted offering that a man may devote to Yahuwah of all that he has, both man and beast of the field of his possession shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted offering is most holy to Yahuwah. So this pertains to the spoils of war. Let's look at a, a passage. Chapter uh, um, Joshua. <coughs> Chapter, chapter six. All right, Joshua chapter six. Um, reading from verse 17. I'll read from 17 and 19. It says, now the city shall be doomed. This is the destruction of Jericho, right? Now the city shall be doomed by Yahuwah to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, and she and all who were with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Verse 18, and you by all means abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed. When you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel accursed, and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to Yahuwah. They shall come into the treasury of Yahuwah. So those things could not be redeemed. Akon violates this, right? Chapter 7, verse 11 of Joshua says this, Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived. And they have also put in it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies 
because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow because thus saith Yahuwah Elohim of Israel, there is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which Yahuwah takes shall come according to, to families, and the family which Yahuwah takes shall come by households, and the household which Yahuwah takes come man by man. Then it shall be that he who is taken with the accursed thing shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of Yahuwah because he has done a disgraceful thing in Israel, right? And if we keep reading, we see he called out the tribes, he calls out the men, and Achan was the man who had stolen, who had hid some of the treasure from the spoils from Yah. He was doomed. He had um, a uh, ban on him based upon his violation of Yahuwah's instructions in the spoils of war. So that's the example of that. Verse 30 goes into uh, tithes and it says, all the tithe of the land, whether of seed of the land or of fruit of the tree is Yahuwah's. It is holy to Yahuwah. If one man wants to at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one fifth to it. And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock, or whether passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy to Yahuwah. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchanges it all, then both it and the one exchanged for, it shall be holy, it shall be redeemed. These are the commandments which Yahuwah commanded Moses for the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. So tithes. Um, you had three aspects of tithing here mentioned in scripture, and we'll look at a couple passages. Tithes to the priests, there were tithes of food, and there were tithes to the poor. So Numbers, uh, which is the book we'll get into next, chapter 18, Chapter 18, looking at verse 21, says this, Behold, I have given the children of Levi all tithes, all the tithes in Israel, as inheritance for return for the work which they perform. The work of the tabernacle of meeting, Hereafter, the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle, Sister Diane brought this out earlier, um, shall perform all um, the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations, that among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. For the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to Yahuwah, I have given to the Levites an inheritance. Therefore, I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. <clears throat> Verse 25. Um, then Yahuwah spoke to Moses, saying, speak thus to the Levites and say to them, when you take from the children of Israel the tithes which I give, which I have given to you, or I have, I have given you from them as your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heave offering of it to Yahuwah. One tenth of the tithe and your heave offering shall be reckoned to you as though it were grain of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the winepress. Of the fullness. Yeah, of the wine press. Thus you shall also offer a heave offering to Yahuwah 
from all your tribes, which you receive from the children of Israel. And you shall give Yahuwah's heave offering from it to Aaron's priest. Of all your gifts, you shall offer up heave offering, <clears throat> offering due to Yahuwah from all the best of them and consecrated part of them. Therefore, you shall say to them, when you have lifted up the best of it, then the rest shall be counted to the Levites as the produce of the threshing floor and of the wine press. You may eat it in any place, you and your households, for it is your reward for your work in the tabernacle of meeting. All right, so we see that the Levites received this tithe from the people for all of their services. Um, tithes were also food, um, as we as we'll read again in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter fourteen says this, starting in verse twenty-two. <clears throat> Um, this is describing the tithing principles. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you shall eat, therefore, I'm sorry, and you shall eat before Yahuwah, your Elohim, in the place where he chooses to make his name abide. The tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil of the firstborn of your heads and your flocks, that you may learn to fear Yahuwah, your Elohim always. But if the journey is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe, or if the place where Yahuwah, your Elohim, chooses to put his name is too far from you, when Yahuwah, your Elohim, has blessed you, then you shall exchange it for money. Take the money in your hand and go to the place which Yahuwah, your Elohim, chooses, and you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep or wine or similar drink, for whatever your heart desires, you shall eat there before Yahuwah, your Elohim, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. You shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates, for he has no part nor inheritance with you. So we see that it was food, that it was for the Levites. Money was also part of that. So you could buy it, you can give that to the Levites to purchase, you can eat it, but it had to be done and a tithe had to be given to the Levites. Picking up verse 28, it also extends to the poor. At the end of, of every third year, you shall bring out your tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied that Yahuwah Elohim may bless you in all your work in your hands, which you do. So absolutely um, giving a, a principle to those that provided service, the service of Yahuwah, that provided counseling, that provided sacrifices, that gave instruction on Torah, uh, all of those that were poor, all of those that were fatherless, all of those that were widows were able to receive from the giving of the people. The same thing we see in the book of Acts. The same thing we offer now. You know, we have an opportunity to give and we use it for those purposes, for assembly needs and for the poor and the needy and those who are um, in need. So we have to make sure that we stay true to these things and not be distracted by the abuse of this in this world and the way that it is taught in this world. It's not meant to build cathedrals and seven million dollar buildings and jet planes and fancy cars. That's not what this is about. Um, and because people have distorted it, 
doesn't mean that it, you still don't give for these opportunities for ministry and to provide um, resources for ministry to be carried out. So we have to be mindful of that and not allow the enemy to distort our thinking when it comes to making sure that everyone is taken care of in our fellowship. So praise Yah. <clears throat> so as we can clearly see, this chapter um, provided for us um, an understanding to keep our commitments, you know, to Yah. When we make a vow to be honest with it, you know, if we're volunteering, be true to our understanding of what that volunteered service, you know, requires, you know, of us, of our families even. You know, sometimes we offer things and we haven't considered how it would affect our family. Could we then regret the decisions we make based upon our where our families respond? You know, so we have to take all those things into consideration, you know. Husbands, talk to your wives before you offer your, your family to do something, vice versa. Have those conversations. How is this going to affect us? Is this necessary for us to be living in accordance to the will of the Father for us, for our family? All things aren't that way. Some things we want to do aren't necess don't necessarily mean that we should do them, right? Be honest with all of our dealings, this book is telling us as well, this chapter in everything that we do. And the culmination of this, <clears throat> we talk about vows, we talk about pledges. <clears throat> Who from the foundation of this world pledged that he would redeem us for a price? We know that the Levitical priesthood points to Messiah. Titus chapter two, verse 11. For the grace of Elohim that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great Elohim and savior Yahushua Messiah, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Yahushua redeemed us after he pledged to redeem us. He held his vow true, and that is the catalyst of all that we do following his example. You know, and as we conclude uh, this book, this beautiful book of Leviticus, um, you know, we see, <laughs> you know, very clearly, we can't, you can't just read through Leviticus. <laughs> no way. You'll get confused, like my brother Devlon said. If you're not paying attention, not only to the cadence, but the history and the instruction. This book has to be studied. This book has to be dissected. You have to go through it the way we did in order to get the true meaning, to understand all that it's saying. This book is about holiness, um, the requirements for fellowship with Elohim. Holiness is the center of Torah, Leviticus being in the middle. You know, it shows us the precepts of his laws. You know, the standards of his conduct, we see. Um, the penalties that, that are attached to the violations of those instructions, of those laws. Um, he also gives us the grounds for fellowship in sacrifice. Um, and all of the sacrifices, every one of them points to Messiah, which I just read in Second Titus uh, chapter two, verse eleven through four, um, and it establishes this book establishes our walk with Yah um, through separation on how a set apart people was to live and act, conduct business 
sacrifice, fellowship, worship, eat, sleep, drink, clean, sanitary. Everything for life is in here. And it's about us being set apart and living that way. So what a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, and, you know, just really had a good time going through it with you guys. Um, and we hit the book of numbers. Um, we'll, we'll start with the introduction next week and dive into our next book. So praise Yah and Shabbat Shalom. Shalom. We pray this video is helpful to your journey in the truth. Remember to be like the Bereans in Acts 17.11, who received the word with all readiness of mind, then searched the scriptures to see if what they heard was true. We have studies for the whole family, including children, every week. To learn more, visit assemblyofyahuwah.com. Use the Join tab to express interest in participating. Use the Give tab to help support Biblical Assembly needs. To be notified of new videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Trust in Yahuwah with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Much love and shalom.